Welcome, good morning. Welcome to this morning's event, Transatlantic Trade and Cooperation in Times of Global Turmoil, a conversation with Valdis Dombrovskis. Thank you to all of you who are here in the room. Thank you to all of you who are watching the live stream of this event. And thanks to everyone who will tune in uh, and watch this event uh, at their convenience uh, online at a later time. I am Michael Strain, Director of Economic Policy Studies here at the American Enterprise Institute. My colleague Stan Voyer and I are honored to welcome all of you here, and we are honored to welcome Mr. Dombrovskis back to AEI. This event takes place at a time when the United States is turning away from international engagement and turning away from free trade. In their place, the United States is turning inward and is turning toward industrial policy. There is much to say about the perils of economic nationalism. There is much to say about the folly of industrial policy, just as there is much to say about the importance of free trade and of the transatlantic relationship. But I promised Stan that I would keep these remarks brief, and so I will not say everything that there uh, is to say. That is not my natural style, so we'll see how the rest of these uh, introductory remarks goes. A central question for world leaders and the global policy community is the extent to which they are committed to the foundational relationships, dispositions, and institutions that have kept the West safe and free for decades. Safe and free and prosperous. Much of the discussion about the rise of authoritarianism and the potential fracturing of the world into blocks rightly focuses on diplomatic and security ramifications but there are serious economic implications as well. The transatlantic economy supports nearly $6 trillion in total commercial sales annually. Nearly two thirds of global investment in the US comes from Europe and vice versa. There are 5 million Americans who work for European companies in the United States and roughly the same number of Europeans who work for US companies in Europe. Relationships this important should be handled with care and purposiveness. This relationship was handled poorly by the Trump administration and it frayed in those years. I am disappointed that the Biden administration has continued with nationalist policies that hurt the transatlantic relationship as well. It is in the economic interest of the United States and Europe together to shore up the global rules-based system that encourages cooperation, healthy competition, economic specialization, open markets, free trade, and innovation. This is why I am so pleased when my colleagues engage European leaders, policymakers, and scholars to advance and strengthen the transatlantic relationship. And this is why I am so pleased to welcome Mr. Dombrovskis back to AEI. The run of show for this event will be straightforward. After I am done with this introduction, I will invite Mr. Dombrovskis to the stage to deliver remarks. Following his remarks, he and Dr. Voyer will have uh, a conversation on this stage, and that will be followed by questions from the audience. For the virtual audience, you're welcome to submit questions to Beatrice Lee. Her email address is beatrice.lee at aei.org. You can find the spelling of that on the event page. You're also welcome to submit questions using Twitter with the hashtag AskAEIEcon. That's hashtag AskAEIEcon. Now let me introduce our speakers. My colleague, Dr. Voiger, is senior fellow here at AEI. He is also the editor of AEI Economic Perspectives and a fellow at the IE School of Politics, Economics, and Global Affairs at Tilburg University. He has served as a visiting lecturer of economics at Harvard University. Valdis Dombrovskis is executive vice president of the European Commission for an Economy that Works for People and European Commissioner for Trade. Among his many previous policymaking positions, he served as European Commissioner for Financial Stability, Financial Services, and Capital Market, Markets Union from 2016 to 2020, as Minister of Finance of Latvia from 2002 to 2004, and as Prime Minister of Latvia from 2009 to 2014. Executive Vice President, it is an honor to host you again at the American Enterprise Institute. Thank you for your service. Thank you for the work you do to strengthen ties between the United States and Europe, and thank you for being here today.
So, uh, thank you for your uh, introduction, Michael. Uh, it's a, a, a great pleasure to join you here at the American Enterprise Institute. Uh, your organization's mission statement is uh, defending human dignity, expanding human potential, and building a freer and safer world rooted in democracy and free enterprise. Uh, in my view, this could serve as a mission statement for a transatlantic partnership in 2023. Uh, we are operating at a time of geopolitical flux and upheaval. Uh, war has returned to Europe. The global ambitions of authoritarian regimes are growing. At the same time, we must not lose uh, sight of the green and digital transformations of our economies. Uh, the shared values we promote and the uh, pillars of the global community, uh, which we spent decades putting in place, are under intense uh, pressure. So, we must ask ourselves, uh, uh, what we want the next phase in transatlantic cooperation to look like? How will uh, our choices influence uh, global trends? And which uh, uh, pitfalls we should, avoid, uh, uh, we should avoid along the way? Uh, I propose to offer my take uh, on these uh, challenges, uh, but let me start by laying my cards on the uh, table. Uh, I am fully committed transatlanticists. Uh, this uh, conviction goes uh, back uh, to a time when I grew up in Soviet-occupied uh, Latvia. So uh, trust me, for those who have experienced life in a, a totalitarian regime, uh, we will never doubt the price of freedom. Uh, as the Prime Minister of Latvia pushed for even stronger transatlantic uh, cooperation. Uh, the Baltic nations feel a strong historical bond to the United States as our ally and supporter. Uh, we uh, firmly believe that both sides of the Atlantic and indeed the global community fare better when the EU and US work together. So it's in, in this uh, spirit of uh, cooperation uh, that I am in uh, Washington DC to meet my US uh, counterparts. Uh, President von der Leyen and Biden recently pledged to deepen our cooperation as we transition to clean uh, energy uh, com uh, economies. Uh, they have also uh, committed to address shared economic and national security challenges uh, and, I quote, stand by Ukraine for as long as it takes. The latter point is uh, crucial. Uh, because uh, Russia's brutal and unprovoked war against Ukraine unites as, uh, as never before. Uh, we have demonstrated a resolve that uh, confounded Russia and other uh, authoritarian regimes uh, around uh, the world. We provided Ukraine both the means and moral support to resist and push back against the aggressor. Uh, we uh, share information, coordinate at every step and act with great uh, precision. Uh, our uh, support for Ukraine has galvanized that nation's uh, heroic defense. By imposing sanctions, we have uh, diminished Russia's capacity to wage war. Uh, the uh, country's GDP is expected to drop by 5.6% this year, according to the OECD. Uh, we have weakened Russia's economy and military industry. But uh, isolation takes uh, time. The job is far from complete. So we must do more to improve uh, effectiveness of our sanctions. Uh, I therefore welcome the work that the US and EU member states are doing on sanctions enforcement. Uh, there is a range of actors uh, engaged in sanction circumvention and others who turn a blind eye. Uh, we should call them out. Uh, our special focus should be on enforcing sanctions uh, of uh, those items that are found uh, uh, on the Ukrainian battlefields. And uh, I'm troubled uh, at uh, Russia's presidency uh, of the UN Security Council. This uh, undermines uh, what the democratic world has achieved since the Second World War. Uh, it highlights the flaws of current multilateral architecture. Uh, for Ukraine to win this war, it needs a continuous and unwavering political, military and economic support uh, from Europe, uh, from the US and from the entire democratic world. Uh, military support, first and foremost, and additionally, financial and uh, budgetary support is vital for Ukraine's victory. 
the EU's economic, humanitarian and military support uh, pledged to Ukraine is around 67 billion euros. This includes uh, 18 uh, billion euros this year in macrofinancial assistance to support the functioning of the Ukrainian state. Uh, last month, the IMF approved an arrangement under the extended fund facility uh, of uh, $15.6 billion. This is a, a, a strong and important signal. So uh, I would like to express my uh, uh, gratitude to the US for its strong and consistent support. Uh, let me also emphasize that the European Union and its citizens shoulder a significant burden in support of a free Ukraine and free Europe. Uh, last month, uh, more than 8 million Ukrainian refugees uh, were present across uh, Europe. Uh, Poland alone hosts more than 1.5 million Ukrainians. Uh, millions of people have welcomed Ukrainians into their homes, providing shelter and food. Uh, EU member states have granted temporary protection status to more than 5 million Ukrainian refugees, uh, this means that they have access to education, social protection and health systems, and the right to work. Uh, not only European uh, companies, but also uh, every single European have chipped in by paying higher energy bills uh, from their own pockets. Uh, in my own country, Latvia, uh, energy inflation in February was 46% compared to the year earlier. Uh, this uh, effort should not be underestimated. Uh, our goal should be for Ukraine to win and for Russia's threat to be neutralized. Uh, uh, because believe me, in the opposite case, uh, Russia will continue its aggressive wars and other powers will learn from our mistakes. Uh, now let me widen the lens. Uh, our remarkable coordination on Ukraine can and must be replicated in other areas. We should learn lessons of war, not forget them. Uh, this is the best way to drive our shared progress and uh, prosperity and the best way to defend and promote our values across the globe. Uh, we must make our policy and economic plans converge rather than diverge. Uh, doing so will boost our economic strengths. And remember, our economic strengths is foundational to our capacity to project and defend our values. So, first and foremost, the EU and US should aim to build a strong and prosperous transatlantic marketplace. We should strive to be a global standard-setting machine. Uh, and we should align our work on economic security, including for de-risking and diversifying our supply chains. Uh, we also need each other on technological development. Uh, we need to ground technological progress in democratic values. And of course, we should work together on climate action. Uh, later this year, the EU will present a new economic security strategy. Uh, we will remain strong champions for a functioning, uh, up-to-date global rules base, but we will also push for a better yet targeted use of trade and tech security tools. Uh, in particular, we need to avoid leakage of uh, emerging and sensitive technologies to authoritarian regimes. Uh, there are concerns that our dual-use technologies are used to enhance their military and intelligence capabilities or used in breach of human rights. The EU will make every effort to align its economic de-risking strategy with our like-minded partners, including the US. Uh, our discussion on economic security at the Trade and Technology Council is part of this broader effort. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, we should be ambitious for the transatlantic relationship. Uh, thankfully, we have an excellent foundation to build on, uh, our trade in goods reached all-time high of over 1.1 trillion euros last year. We share the largest and wealthiest market in the world. And we already have a perfect platform for developing the policy responses we need. Uh, I'm speaking, of course, of the EU-US Trade and Technology Council. Uh, this remains a key forum on, uh, in which to build a modern transatlantic trade agenda. Uh, we have used the TTC to coordinate our sanctions on Russia, our approaches on technology and security issues. Uh, but we need to deliver more on the trade side. Uh, I want to see uh, clear trade deliverables at the next month's TTC meeting in Sweden. 
Uh, key targets uh, include moving forward on trade facilitation and conformity assessment. We should also be aiming to move forward on uh, digital and sustainable trade. And looking to the future, uh, I want uh, the TTC to be even bolder in its ambitions. Uh, in my view, we should be aiming for nothing less than a green transatlantic marketplace. Uh, this is how, together, we can lead the transition to the net zero economy. Uh, the EU has a strong uh, climate plan in place for several years, the European Green Deal. Uh, we are taking ambitious uh, steps to become the world's first climate neutral continent. Uh, uh, more recently, the uh, US proposed a green industrial plan of its own, the Inflation Reduction Act. Uh, we welcome that the US is uh, showing uh, climate ambition to match Europe's. Uh, uh, but we add just one very uh, simple message. Uh, let's make our plans work uh, together so that we all benefit. Uh, you are all familiar with the EU concerns on Inflation Reduction Act, namely that EU companies will be discriminated against on, uh, in the US uh, market. Uh, this smacks of lose-lose, uh, but we should be aiming for win-win. Uh, there is too much at stake. Uh, consider the facts. Um, uh, last year, U.S. companies active in Europe uh, earned an estimated uh, $325 billion, and it's a record high. Uh, uh, Europe accounted for over half of foreign direct investment into the U.S. in 2022. European companies in the U.S. employ million, millions of American workers. And with Europe decoupling from Russia, U.S. exports of LNG to Europe hit their highest level. Uh, let's be clear, we are not opposed in principle to domestic support for green transition. Uh, indeed, we already have some of our own. Uh, but we should not be putting up barriers. Uh, instead, as I mentioned, we should seize this unique opportunity to build a green transatlantic marketplace. Uh, aligning uh, the uh, European Green Deal and the uh, uh, IRA to form a positive feedback loop. Uh, turbocharging the green transition via shared supply chains and transatlantic efficiencies. Uh, creating new industrial champions on both, both sides. And driving climate action globally. Uh, we have taken steps in the right direction recently. Uh, I welcome the new dialogue on clean energy incentives uh, announced by Presidents von der Leyen and Biden. This new work stream in the TTC is designed to coordinate our incentive programs. It will also help us to avoid disruptions to transatlantic trade. Uh, we'll share information on our respective support measures and on non-market practices. <coughs> uh, similarly, we are working on a targeted critical minerals agreement. Uh, this is es es essential uh, to ensure that EU is uh, 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 treated fairly under uh, Inflation Reduction Act. Uh, for us, it's a uh, simply is a, 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 a case of good economic sense. Uh, it is also a necessary step for the U.S. to show its uh, seri uh, seriousness about removing unnecessary trade obstacles. Uh, there are other TTC work streams that must uh, stack, uh, step up to the plate. Uh, for example, the Transatlantic Initiative on Sustainable Trade, or uh, TIST for short. Uh, let me explain. The EU and US agree on a private sector's central role in boosting clean tech development. Uh, market forces, international trade, and business will drive uh, uh, the changes we need. The EU has put forward Net Zero Industry Act as a blueprint for our green industrial transformation. Uh, achieving this goal will require diversification of supply for key inputs. It will also mean reliable global partners. <coughs> And that's where uh, TIST comes into picture. This new initiative can help to set common standards for uh, specific green goods and technologies. Uh, it can help to avoid new barriers and reduce existing ones. Uh, it can protect the level playing field and fair competition. Uh, and finally, it can help to build uh, resilient supply chains and address unsustainable dependencies. Uh, we have other areas uh, ripe for enhanced cooperation. Uh, trade can be a contributor to the uh, decarbonization of key uh, sectors. Uh, here I'm thinking of our work on global sustainable arrangement on steel and aluminium. Uh, these sectors produce up to 10% of global emissions. 
Uh, therefore, greening them will incentivize other uh, sectors to follow suit. <coughs> uh, we believe the uh, GSA can be expanded into flagship initiative uh, of the EU-US net zero agenda. Uh, from the EU side, we have set out clear proposals. Uh, we uh, want to rebalance uh, trade in uh, these sectors and overcome existing disputes. And we want to make sure that our climate change uh, policies are compatible while fully respecting our WTO obligations. Uh, in short, we want GSA to lead by example. Uh, as we ramp up our net zero uh, cooperation, it can create a green transatlantic uh, corridor for steel and aluminium. By setting this standard, we will enjoy first mover advantage and create strong positive momentum for others to join. Uh, finally, I want to briefly look beyond our bilateral relationship, because this is also essential. Uh, uh, because e even if we succeed in uh, every area I described, uh, we still need to bring other global partners along with us. Uh, I'm specifically working, uh, thinking of our work at the World Trade Organization. The WTO is the most logical multilateral forum to create green coalitions of the willing. Uh, our work in the Coalition of Trade Ministers on Climate can be a valuable building block in this respect. Uh, I'm grateful that the U.S. was one of the first countries to join this coalition. Let's use this uh, forum to get the ball rolling at global level. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, let me conclude on a hopeful note. Uh, the sky is the limit. Uh, just over the past five years, transatlantic green trade has increased by 28%. Uh, now consider how much more trade and investment uh, we could unlock by lifting unnecessary barriers in both directions and preventing new ones. Uh, the TTC is our best hope to make this happen. Uh, our companies and uh, innovators want it to work. We want our trade relationship to move to the next level. Uh, Transatlantic cooperation has uh, all, almost mattered most at the decisive moments of history. Uh, I believe this is one of those moments. So let's join forces to do the smart thing. Thank you. Uh, Executive Vice President, thank you very much for those uh, remarks, espe obviously, especially uh, for the kind endorsement of our mission statement. We, we always appreciate that. And it means that we won't have to update it for at least another uh, 10 years. I have a, a number of questions uh, for you, and then we'll, we'll, we'll open it up to the, to the audience. My first question is about something you didn't really touch upon, which is the trading and broader economic relationship uh, between the European Union and China, um, between the transatlantic community and China, which has been the topic of immense amounts of attention here in the United States. Um, I, I would like to ask you to, to speak broadly on where, where you see that going and what, what, what concerns you may have with the approach the, Europe, the United States is starting to develop toward China. Uh, well, uh, 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 indeed, I didn't mention China by name, but uh, on a number of uh, challenges which I was uh, uh, um, uh, referring to uh, uh, clearly, uh, uh, China is, uh, uh, is uh, the point of uh, focus. So, uh, uh, f first of all, uh, uh, how we define in the EU our relations with uh, China, that uh, on some areas we see uh, China as a cooperation uh, partner, for example, when we are dealing with the climate change, in some we are uh, seeing it as economic uh, competitor, like uh, uh, we uh, uh, to address uh, uh, different uh, issues of the level playing uh, field, uh, non-market practices, and uh, uh, on some areas we are seeing China as a systemic uh, rival uh, as it's promoting a different uh, socio-economic uh, model. So we need to navigate this very complex uh, relationship. <coughs> so where are some uh, focal points uh, right now? Well, uh, first of all, uh, I was uh, mentioning our decoupling from Russia and dealing with our uh, dependency on uh, Russia fossil fuel uh, supplies. Uh, well, uh, we, uh, uh, we had been quite successful in this one. For example, our imports of natural gas from Russia is 80% down to compare with uh, pre-war uh, situation. Uh, but um, 
by uh, doing so, we should not develop new dependencies. And what we see is that when we are uh, moving towards a green and digital economy, it will require different sort of inputs, different uh, 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 raw materials. So for this, we need a, a diversified and resilient uh, supply uh, chain. And in this context, we are talking about uh, de-risking uh, strategy as uh, China is uh, a dominant supplier in quite a few of those uh, uh, raw materials and uh, uh, components. So uh, for this, we recently uh, uh, came with our EU uh, raw materials uh, strategy. I mentioned our uh, targeted work also in EU-US uh, uh, raw materials partnership, uh, which fits into this broader agenda, but also uh, serves to address uh, some of the discriminatory pro provisions in the U.S. Uh, Inflation Reduction Act. Uh, uh, so, uh, to, uh, to put it in, in uh, short, uh, the uh, key word for us is de-risking and uh, risk uh, management. Uh, and uh, clearly important aspect on EU-China uh, relations will be uh, uh, China's uh, position vis-a-vis uh, Russia's aggression against Ukraine and uh, war crimes and atrocities which Russia is committing in uh, uh, Ukraine. Uh, and the uh, quality of our relations will, uh, to a large extent, uh, depend on uh, uh, positions China will be taking in this regard. I see. So that, that doesn't sound like things will, will get any better anytime soon. But so far, um, how, how do you think of the way in which different member states have operated vis-a-vis -vis China? We've seen Lithuania take perhaps the toughest stance toward, toward China. We recently saw the United States and the Netherlands reach agreement on exports of advanced uh, photolithography machines. <laughs> Are you worried that different member states taking these, these different positions is going to lead to an unraveling of a more unified EU stance, or is that not something you're concerned about? Uh, well, uh, 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 first of all, uh, it's uh, worth remembering that uh, uh, EU uh, is a union of uh, uh, 27 independent uh, countries and foreign policy uh, is uh, the competence of uh, individual member states. Uh, we uh, uh, do uh, have, uh, obviously, the coordination, uh, common foreign and security uh, policy. We are coordinating our uh, approach. We are developing uh, European uh, uh, strategies. Uh, we are uh, uh, coordinating the work on uh, sanctions, for example, on other uh, elements. Uh, but uh, certainly there is a, this uh, interplay in the EU between the European level and uh, national uh, uh, level. So to the extent uh, possible, uh, uh, obviously from European Commission uh, side, we are emphasizing that EU is always stronger when it uh, speaks with one voice. So if we can coordinate our approaches and act as one, we are definitely having more impact uh, when we act as uh, 27 different entities. Very good. You've, you've mentioned uh, Russia's war of aggression against Ukraine uh, a few times in very eloquent terms. If you could ask American policymakers uh, to, to do more to help the Ukrainian government, to help the Ukrainian people, which specific requests would you have? Uh, well, uh, 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 first of all, uh, uh, it's uh, 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 in a sense it should not be uh, EU or US uh, uh, driven process, it should be Ukraine driven process. So uh, on a specific uh, request, it's important in a sense, what are the needs of Ukraine, what Ukraine uh, needs right now, on uh, uh, which uh, terms it's uh, possible uh, to arrive at some uh, uh, peace settlement and so on and so forth. So it's, uh, what's important is that we uh, coordinate our uh, response, that we listen to uh, our uh, Ukrainian uh, counterparts, what uh, the needs uh, are. Well, so far I was saying, uh, uh, I would say, we have been uh, quite uh, successful, both in terms of providing uh, financial support, putting sanctions against uh, Russia, uh, uh, providing uh, military support, for example, also EU through its uh, peace facility is uh, financing the uh, military uh, deliveries uh, to the uh, uh, to, to Ukraine, which is in the first time in uh, EU uh, history that we are providing military support to country at uh, uh, war. Uh, but what is important right now is, in a sense, to stay the course. 
not to let uh, some kind of uh, war uh, fatigue to uh, settle in uh, 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 and uh, not to reduce our uh, uh, support for Ukraine. So that's why I was emphasizing also in my uh, speech the President von der Leyen and Biden's uh, statement to continue to provide support for Ukraine for as long as it takes. That's key. Excellent. Thank you. Um, thank you for that. Uh, to change tack a little bit, you mentioned the uh, protectionist provisions in the Inflation Reduction Act, and I, I, I share your, your, your view on those. I think on the American side, uh, an irritant uh, in the trade, trade relationship are some of the measures that the European Union has, has taken or proposed over the years in the digital sphere in particular. Um, it, I think a few years ago, this really took off with proposed digital service taxes. Uh, in, in more recent years and last year, we saw the adoption of the Digital Markets Act, the Digital Services Act, there are proposals for cloud sovereignty. Um, and um, honestly, it's the topic on which I received the most questions before this event. Uh, what would you say to, to people in the US who are, who are concerned about the, the EU's position in that area um, as, it, as it relates to the sort of ongoing free trade relationship between the two countries? Uh, well, uh, indeed, uh, you uh, mentioned uh, digital uh, uh, services uh, taxes. Indeed, there had been uh, uh, concerns in the EU, uh, 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 in a sense that EU is not getting, so to say, its fair uh, share of uh, taxes from the economic activities which are taking place uh, uh, at the EU uh, uh, territory, uh, providing uh, uh, services to uh, EU uh, citizens and uh, companies. Uh, uh, and indeed, we were looking for a policy response to this, uh, uh, clearly creating a number of questions on the US side. Well, eventually, we uh, managed uh, to find an agreement at international uh, level. So I'm talking about uh, the OECD uh, agreement on uh, 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 both uh, effective minimum taxation and allocation of taxation rights. So, and I think that's the best way uh, forward that we agree uh, internationally because that's a problem which concerns not only EU and US but also other jurisdictions. So what's important now that uh, this OECD agreement is timely and properly implemented both in EU, uh, EU and US. And that then would help to put, so to say, these uh, concerns uh, 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 behind us. Uh, uh, as regards um, some other uh, digital economy uh, uh, aspects, uh, well, indeed, uh, our approach, uh, uh, for example, on uh, data protection, on uh, privacy, uh, is somewhat different in EU, where we're putting more emphasis on this than it's uh, in uh, uh, US, so uh, we need to see uh, to, uh, to extend to find uh, mutually uh, workable uh, solutions. And that's why I was mentioning uh, our Trade and Technology uh, Council, which provides us excellent platform to, to discuss those issues and to find the solutions which uh, work for both sides. You're optimistic that, that, that you'll succeed. Well, we have to work together. <laughs> Very good. Um, let me uh, do one question from, from, our, from our online audience. And, Meanwhile, here in the room, please start thinking about your own questions. Um, Robert Francis from Borderlax asks, could you tell us more about what is in the EU proposals for the global arrangement on steel and aluminum? How are these proposals received in Washington? How confident are you you can reach agreement in time for, for October? Yeah. Well, uh, how are the proposals received in uh, Washington? I would be in a position to give a more precise answer uh, tomorrow okay. when I'll have a meeting with uh, U.S. Trade Representative Ambassador Catherine Tai, where we'll be discussing, among others, uh, exactly these uh, uh, issues. In any case, both sides are uh, seriously engaged. Uh, we are uh, working with uh, the uh, deadline of October uh, this year in uh, mind. That's when we need to reach this uh, uh, agreement. Uh, Presidents uh, von der Leyen and Biden reiterated this uh, 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 commitment. So what are important elements uh, uh, from, uh, uh, from the EU? So first, uh, uh, it uh, needs to put a definite end to the uh, Trump 232 uh, uh, tariffs. As you know, we reached some uh, interim solution uh, uh, replacing those uh, tariffs with tariff rate quotas which respect the historical trade volumes between EU and US in these uh, uh, sectors. Uh, second, uh, it needs to be WTO uh, compatible. Uh, 
So uh, uh, at the EU, we are, uh, uh, as I was saying, strongly championing uh, multilateralism. So we do not want to engage in solutions which undermine multilateral rules-based uh, trading uh, system. Uh, and it needs to uh, align and respect our uh, different approaches on uh, uh, greening our uh, economy. So those are the three, uh, three key uh, parameters through which uh, we are approaching this work on uh, global uh, uh, sustainable arrangement. Um, uh, President Biden uh, arrived in Belfast, I think yesterday, who knows with the time difference. Um, obviously the EU trade relationship with Britain, with Northern Ireland is a, is a complicated one and one that is in, in flux. Can you, can you talk to us about how, where you think that's going whether the situation is going to get settled anytime soon, what are your what are your concerns there? Is there anything you think the U.S. can can contribute there? Well, uh, 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 first of all, uh, uh, I would like to hope that the uh, situation is to large extent uh, solved. So we have our uh, trade and cooperation agreement with uh, UK already for a couple of years. Uh, we uh, recently reached so-called Windsor Agreement, which uh, clarifies the implementation of uh, 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 certain uh, provisions of Northern Ireland uh, Protocol. So uh, uh, we hope now uh, with the implementation of this Windsor Agreement, we can put this uh, uh, dispute behind us. Uh, it's uh, also clear, however, that the uh, uh, trade uh, uh, between uh, EU and UK is not going to be as uh, uh, smooth and uh, seamless as uh, it was before. But that comes uh, by design. It was uh, UK decision to leave the EU and to leave the EU single market. So uh, c uh, clearly uh, that requires some more uh, paperwork and uh, controls. Uh, so that's something that lots of businesses just will need to uh, to adjust. But uh, uh, as regards U.S., well, certainly we appreciate uh, President Biden's strong engagement in this uh, uh, question, also of uh, um, uh, uh, solving the uh, problems of implementation of Northern Ireland uh, uh, pr protocol. So, uh, 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 and uh, uh, generally on... Uh, 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 preserving the uh, well, uh, good uh, working relationship and uh, good uh, trade relationship between uh, like-minded uh, partners and democratic world, and that's uh, important uh, in the current context when we are uh, faced with more fragmented and conflictual geopolitical landscape. Very good. Let's take a few questions uh, from our uh, in-person audience. Here, let's go first to uh, Greg Ip. Uh, thanks very much, and thanks for doing this. Can you give us an update on the status of the economic coercion instrument that you're working on? And specifically, do you see scope for coordinating the use of that instrument with the United States and other members of the G7? Uh, yeah, well, uh, as regards uh, anti-coercion uh, uh, instruments, so the political agreement on the anti-coercion instrument is... Uh, 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 reached. We are now uh, finalizing the legislative uh, work and uh, hopefully very soon uh, that will be uh, the case. So, uh, um, uh, uh, so uh, 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 there are, uh, I would say, clear prospects of anti-coercion instrument becoming uh, a law. Uh, in terms of uh, uh, cooperation on economic co uh, coercion and I would say also broader on economic uh, security. Certainly we uh, see the scope uh, uh, both bilaterally uh, between EU and uh, US, uh, uh, notably is through the Trade and Technology uh, Council and this is indeed one of the items which is uh, in uh, discussions there. Uh, but uh, also uh, now there is a uh, 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 I would say Japanese G7 presidency is putting quite a bit of emphasis on the economic uh, security matters, on economic security uh, coordination, and uh, 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 anti-coercion instrument is uh, certainly important part of the EU toolbox to ensure this uh, broader economic uh, security. Very good. Let's go over, over here, Christian. And please, I forgot to say it before, please introduce yourself. 
very briefly before you ask your question that is supposed to end in a question. You already did stand, yeah? Thanks, thanks for this talk. Kristen Forsten, the Hans Seidel Foundation here in Washington. Um, you made, Mr. Vice President, you made very clear that uh, trade is more than free trade or um, economic prosperity. Yeah? It's ge uh, geostrategic relevance. And uh, certainly with the US, yeah, it's a shared commitment yeah, to a free and liberal world. But you didn't talk about TTIP, maybe. Yeah? And we uh, don't call it TTIP anymore. But do you see this um, any, any way a revival of a free trade agreement yeah, between Europe and America? And if so, yeah, why are Europeans still so skeptical yeah, against uh, free trade with America or open trade, a transatlantic marketplace? Do you think today TTIP would get a, a majority in the European Parliament or the Council? Uh, well, uh, uh, first of all, uh, indeed, uh, right now uh, TTIP is not uh, on uh, the agenda and there had been, uh, I would say, uh, uh, lots of difficulties uh, on both sides of Atlantic. It exposed also our uh, differences on many uh, aspects, uh, uh, trade um, uh, aspects, so probably it will take some time before we can uh, start uh, uh, discussing uh, putting, uh, for example, bilateral free trade agreement on the agenda. That's why I'm emphasizing that we need now to do uh, maximum through the Trade and Technology Council, uh, uh, also in the area of trade, through trade facilitation, through uh, uh, conformity assessments, through building this green, uh, tra green transatlantic marketplace, so there are a number of uh, uh, ambitions where I would say from the EU side we are very much uh, uh, willing to uh, engage and willing to advance and uh, uh, certainly hope also for uh, uh, strong US uh, ambition in these areas. Thank you. Uh, Tristan? Hi, uh, Tristan Reed from the World Bank. I want to ask about the Net Zero Industry Act uh, in Europe. So there are a couple of initiatives there to, as you say, diversify supply of, say, solar panels away from China and also uh, reshore production to Europe. Uh, but industry has been quite clear that you know China is a by far the low cost producer, and these initiatives will incur you know greater costs of solar panels. So I'm wondering if you've uh, have any estimates of how much this will slow uh, decarbonization, if at all, uh, this initiative? Thanks. Well, uh, first of all, the aim of this uh, initiative is to uh, accelerate the decarbonization, and it's uh, uh, a part of our broader European Green Deal uh, initiative. And uh, in the European Green uh, Deal, we have uh, targets of emission reduction by 55% by 2030, and climate neutrality by uh, 2050. And there is a number of uh, legislative uh, initiatives, for example, our Fit for 55 package, but also now Net uh, Zero uh, Industry Act, uh, which uh, are uh, dealing with implementation of European Green uh, Deal, and obviously dealing also with some of the uh, new uh, challenges uh, coming from uh, Russia's aggression against uh, Ukraine, but coming also, for example, from uh, U.S. Uh, Inflation Reduction Act. So, uh, uh, but uh, uh, all in all, uh, 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 as I was mentioning uh, before, now when we are uh, 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 paying economically high price for addressing our uh, strategic dependency, which we had on uh, Russia's fossil fuel supplies, so uh, it took lots of efforts, lots of investment, we are paying uh, much higher energy prices in Europe than, for example, in the US uh, uh, to move away from uh, Russia's uh, fossil fuel supplies. We should not be building new strategic dependencies. Uh, and uh, indeed, it may well be that uh, diversification and resilience of supply chains is not going to be entirely cost-free, uh, uh, but uh, it's uh, definitely a price uh, worth uh, paying uh, for uh, ensuring that we have, uh, can be uh, safe about our path towards climate neutrality, about green and digital economy, and we uh, don't uh, depend on uh, one uh, player changing its mind and suddenly, for example, uh, cutting supplies of this or that uh, uh, goods. Very good. Claude? Hi, Claude Barfield, AEI. Um, I'd like to come back to China. 
I know we're a long way from Henry Kissinger's complaint that uh, he didn't, there was nobody to call and nobody who was to answer the phone in Europe. But now we have a number of phones, and mm -hmm. I think we'd be remiss without asking you a question about President Macron's recent visit to China, where he, he seemed to stake out a position for not speaking for Europe, but certainly for himself, and he's important in Europe, of, of a kind of strategic independence. And he used the phrase that he did not want, Europe did not want to be vassals of either the United States or China. The United States is moving towards some kind of broader decoupling. Where is Europe in that regard? And how strong do you think Macron's opinion is throughout Europe about China? Uh, well, uh, uh, first of all, as he was mentioning, that EU is a union of 27 uh, countries. So uh, it's uh, uh, true that the views of uh, different EU member states on different uh, topics may uh, vary. That's why it requires also lots of uh, EU uh, 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 coordination to uh, ensure that to the extent possible, EU is uh, speaking in one uh, voice. Uh, uh, as regards uh, uh, China, as already mentioning, the EU uh, position is indeed that we are not heading towards the decoupling from China, but we are rather heading uh, towards de-risking and better risk management, avoiding strategic uh, dependency. So that's, uh, in a sense, uh, a trajectory we are uh, taking as a EU uh, with -vis China. Very good. Let's go over here. Sorry, uh, a grayish, brown, black dotted shirt. Thank you. Hi, Mara Lee, International Trade Today. Uh, you talked about wanting to develop a green uh, marketplace between Europe and the U.S. And I wanted to ask about the difficulties of CBAM, given that there's no national carbon price in the U.S. Even if chemicals um, produced here are produced in a green way, how can Europe smooth the way for less um, barriers to those exports if CBAM comes in? Yeah, well, uh, uh, when we are uh, uh, devising our uh, green uh, uh, support uh, instruments and uh, also other uh, policies include uh, carbon pricing uh, policies, uh, we are always uh, taking lots of care uh, to devise them in non-discriminatory and WTO compatible way. And that's uh, exactly uh, what was the case also with uh, CBAM. So what, uh, what is the baseline here? Uh, we are moving towards uh, uh, climate neutrality, so we can no longer provide uh, free uh, emission uh, allowances to uh, energy incentive industries uh, like uh, steel and aluminium, cement, fertilizers, electricity. So we'll be starting putting carbon price also on those uh, sectors. But then we need to uh, deal with the problem of carbon leakage. Uh, and that's exactly where CBAM comes in, that we put the same price of carbon as we put domestically uh, on uh, uh, um, uh, importers. Uh, and that's uh, this uh, non-discrimination uh, is a key for WTO uh, compatibility. Uh, so, uh, the same price of carbon which EU producers will be paying, importers will be paying, and thus the level playing field in the EU market will be preserved. Uh, and uh, a couple of other points. So, first we will take uh, into account individual emissions in a concrete uh, producing facility. So, it means uh, if company will be investing in decarbonizing, re reducing the carbon content of their production, CBAM will go down and we will take a uh, price of carbon in third uh, uh, country. So if there is a price of carbon in third country, it will be deducted from our uh, CBAM, clearly showing that it's an environmental uh, 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 measure. Uh, well, uh, now uh, CBAM is entering into force as reporting requirements. So for a couple of years, it will operate as a reporting requirement, so giving time for uh, companies to familiarize with the system. Uh, and then it would uh, start applying as a payment obligation as of uh, 2026. Uh, and also, if you look at our broader um, green economy support measures, once again, a uh, key factor is uh, non-discrimination. Uh, uh, let's take, for example, as a uh, green uh, uh, or, uh, well, uh, 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 vehicles like electrical uh, vehicles. 
we're also uh, having uh, support uh, schemes, subsidy schemes for uh, green uh, uh, or electrical cars in uh, uh, many EU uh, member states. But uh, we are doing it in a non-discriminatory way. Uh, so uh, uh, that also, for example, Tesla made in USA can get the uh, subsidy. So we're not putting some kind of local content or assembly requirements that it's only like European produced uh, uh, cars which can get the subsidy. And in a sense, that's our uh, uh, problem with US Inflation Reduction Act, that they are putting those uh, discriminatory requirements. To take that non-discrimination principle a little further, if you're a tax policy fundamentalist, for lack of a better world, <laughs> word, something you may want to consider is to subsidize exports of, of, of carbon-intensive products, right, As a, to, to make the border adjustment symmetric, right? So you have a, a tariff on, on carbon imports, a subsidy on carbon exports. Is that something that's under consideration? It would certainly help European uh, businesses build economies of scale and be able to, to compete outside the European Union. Uh, as well as inside. Uh, well, uh, I would uh, uh, have uh, two comments there. Well, first, uh, by and large, export subsidies are not WTO compatible. So that's uh, uh, why we are not uh, going down this avenue. And uh, second, uh, we also don't want to uh, enter into uh, subsidy race. Uh, because subsidy races tend to be uh, expensive and uh, uh, inefficient. So uh, when we are looking at our uh, policy response, it has uh, different elements. Yes, there are also green subsidies in the EU, no doubt, and uh, uh, Inflation Reduction Act is forcing us also to have some further considerations in this regard. Uh, but there are also other elements like uh, putting price on uh, uh, carbon and thus creating uh, economic incentive for companies to reduce uh, uh, carbon emissions. Very good. Uh, let's go over here all the way to the left. Hi, thank you. Uh, Stephen Overley from Politico. I wanted to ask about the EU-US critical minerals deal and how close that is to being finalized, um, and a related question, you mentioned the WTO and compatibility a number of times. How much is that a sticking point with the US when it comes to both critical minerals and steel, given that the US has not um, taken WTO compatibility as top of mind? Uh, well, uh, I would uh, uh, say uh, it's uh, less of a concern when we are discussing our critical minerals uh, partnership. So, uh, uh, as I was uh, saying already, I probably would be able to provide more detailed answer on the state of play uh, when I'll have a meeting with uh, Catherine Tai uh, tomorrow, uh, because that's exactly what we'll have on uh, agenda. In any case, uh, we are uh, uh, willing to move uh, forward. We think also that the uh, U.S. Uh, uh, agreement with Japan in uh, 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 area of uh, 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 raw materials provides a useful uh, uh, precedent to build on. Uh, so hopefully uh, this uh, uh, can be concluded in a reasonably short uh, uh, timeline. Well, on uh, uh, global steel and aluminum arrangement, indeed, uh, WTO uh, compatibility uh, is uh, more of a concern. Indeed, it's one of elements which is uh, currently under intensive uh, discussions. Very good. Let's go over here. Good morning, Jorge Valero with uh, Bloomberg. Uh, question on the economic security strategy. Uh, what are the other instruments uh, do you think that should be part of this strategy besides the uh, idea of uh, outbound investment screening? Uh, will these ideas or new proposals be discussed next month in the context of the TTC? And are you concerned that these new ideas and instruments could increase the risk of fragmentation and therefore impact the global growth? Uh, well, uh, as I was mentioning uh, in uh, the uh, speech, uh, uh, we will remain uh, strong uh, proponents of uh, multilateralism and uh, global uh, rules-based uh, trading uh, system. So uh, what we'll do, we'll be taking uh, this uh, into account. Uh, so we'll be uh, looking, therefore, indeed at uh, uh, how, uh, what better uh, targeted uh, uh, instruments we can have in uh, place. I would say this discussion on outbound uh, investment is in relatively uh, early stages. Uh, 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 but uh, uh, also, uh, uh, 
uh, we will need to distinguish between, um, so to say, uh, uh, national security considerations, which are also uh, 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 has provisions under WTO for national security exemption and broader economic security considerations uh, as regards uh, 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 resilience and uh, diversification of our uh, uh, supply chains. So uh, <laughs> I would say one important pitfall to uh, avoid is that uh, uh, this uh, economic security uh, uh, discussion becomes uh, becomes some kind of a cover for uh, protectionism, and it's something which uh, is a point which we are making also now uh, uh, in a context of upcoming G7 uh, discussions, because as you know, it's also an important topic uh, now in uh, G7 under uh, Japanese presidency. Very good. Uh, thank you. Hey, Yun Kim from the Asia Society Policy Institute. My question is about going back to the point that you've made earlier about the European Union is the strongest when it's mixed one voice. Uh, reportedly, there's been a news report that um, regarding the EU's green subsidies plan, there's been a discord within the European Union that whereas France and Germany supports uh, the EU's green subsidies plan in response to the American IRA, whereas the other 25 members are not so much. So I was curious to hear your thoughts uh, on how that is being uh, developed and resolved, and also would be a fair assessment if we think that this is another, another ob obstacle or a reason why the agreement between the European Union and the United States has been taking so long. Thank you. Uh, well, uh, as regards uh, our um, uh, 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 policy response, I already was mentioning a couple of policy uh, initiatives like uh, 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 European uh, 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 Green Deal Industrial Plan and now Net Zero Industry Act, uh, which are the uh, initiatives of the European Commission, which are now put forward for uh, discussions with uh, member states and uh, by and large I would say there has been uh, support for those uh, initiatives. Uh, as always there are some uh, nuances, uh, so uh, notably probably what you were referring was uh, uh, concerning the uh, uh, questions of EU state aid rules. Uh, because indeed there is a discussion that uh, on uh, one hand uh, we will have this new uh, uh, crisis and transition uh, state aid framework, which is going to be uh, temporary till end of 2025, providing more leeway for uh, EU member states to provide aid to greening of their uh, economies, uh, provide uh, support for their companies. Uh, but we need to be mindful of fact that different member states have different cap uh, capacity to finance the state aid. So we need to preserve integrity of the single market. That's why another element which we uh, announced from the European Com uh, Commission side is um, uh, so-called European Sovereignty uh, Fund, uh, which is explicitly uh, aimed to preserve uh, cohesion and level playing field in the single market. So also we're looking at uh, not only member states uh, financing, which is there for the industry, but also EU level support uh, uh, instruments to take care of the fact that different countries have uh, different capabilities to provide state aid. Excellent. We have one final question, uh, Ferdinand Monte. Thank you. Uh, Ferdinando Monte with Georgetown University and uh, AI. So in June uh, last year, the WTO um, uh, approved a waiver for um, uh, COVID uh, related vaccines. And there was, and they left open the possibility to extend this waiver to COVID diagnostics and uh, therapeutics. So I was uh, wondering if you could speak to a little bit to that, where where Europe is on that. If you're worried about, uh, you know, the potential to stifle innovation, and if you're worried about the possibility that once you go down this road, then on the ground of urgency we could adopt any any waiver for any technology, like for example green technology. Thank you. Uh, yeah, uh, on uh, this so-called uh, TRIPS uh, waiver, uh, indeed, uh, EU was very actively engaged in this uh, work. We uh, spent uh, many hours uh, discussing it in so-called quadrilateral uh, format, EU, US, uh, India and South Africa, uh, facilitated with uh, WTO Director General Dr. Ngozi. 
so uh, eventually we were able to reach uh, this uh, agreement and I think it uh, it's, uh, strikes uh, uh, the uh, balance of uh, providing uh, simplifications, uh, waiving certain procedural obligations while uh, preserving the uh, protection of intellectual uh, property, which proved actually indispensable also for uh, rapid development and rollout of uh, COVID-19 uh, vaccines. Uh, indeed, this agreement foresees a potential uh, extension also to therapeutics and uh, diagnostics, and from the EU side, we are uh, uh, ready to constructively engage in this work. Uh, what is the state of play right now? Uh, US is conducting an investigation on this very uh, topic and uh, the results of uh, those investigations are expected at October this year. So probably that's when we'll see more clearly uh, which direction this discussion may take. Very good, Executive Vice President. Thank you uh, again for your service and thank you for speaking here at AEI today. Thank you.